trust the process Pain is power All great things Take time I am Unbreakable Episode 20, we have the published author of No More Average. He is a motivational speaker and a passionate serial entrepreneur who has a powering story of coming from poverty into tapping into his true potential and discovering endless self-education that would eventually lead him to success. Today, we'd like to welcome Andy Andy Audate. There he is, No More Average, baby. (laughs) Hey guys, thank you seriously for having me on the show. Of course, brother. Absolutely, man. Appreciate you. Thank you again, dude. So, like we mentioned, we're gonna go deep, okay? Full vulnerability at its finest. So, before we transition into what led you here today, let's deep dive into your childhood and into your upbringing, and then we'll 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 get it going from there. Right. Yeah, what part? Yeah. So, if possible, let's take it back to Rhode Island. So, I mean, before even Rhode Island. Mm was Boston. Okay. So I lived in Hyde Park, Boston. I was raised in Hyde Park, Boston. Spent about the first seven years of my life there, but still remember it vividly. And I lived right across from my middle school. Mm -hmm. And one instance that I remember was, I don't know, maybe like four or five years old. I go to my mom's, I'm on the third floor apartment. I go outside to the, uh, I go to a window and I look outside. And I see somebody getting beat up. Two guys are jumping, one dude. And there was blood all over the floor. This white dude looks like Eminem getting beat up. <laughs> get, get, getting beat up and, and kicked, kicked, his teeth kicked in. Um, and I go to my mom and I say, Mom, the, uh, I said, Mom, the, someone's getting beat up outside. And she goes, looks, she calls the cops. And the cops come, arrest, arrest uh, the guys. And then there's, my mom's name is on the, is on the, the, the file that, you know, to... As a witness? As a, as a witness or as a caller or whatever. And they summoned her to court to testify. And I'm and the whole family was like, oh shit, don't don't get involved. You know, you don't want to get involved with that, that type of stuff. And that's like the beginning <laughs> of the childhood that I remember. Yeah. You know, that's what I remember gr- growing up, seeing people get beat up, uh, police getting involved, and not, hey, don't trust the mm-hmm. police, and, and run away. Then at seven years old, to go to a safer place, I moved from Boston to Rhode Island and thinking that Rhode Island is going to be safer, um, mm-hmm. much more cheaper. And then instead of me going to public school, the, the thought process was I'm going to go to private school. But little did we know, it's kind of like, you know, money kind of, the amount of money that you have allows you to live in a certain environment regardless of, of where you go. So I go in Rhode Island, but it's a safer place because, it, hey, it's not Boston. It's less known. However, I still go into the hood, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So I go into a city which, unbeknownst to my family, was Sparkle City. That's okay. where we moved into. The Sparkle because of the drugs that was mm-hmm. that was in that environment. But no one knew. We called it Central so Falls. So your mom didn't even know that at that time? Of course not. You, you go into a new town. You go into a new town. You're questioning where, what's, where is the safe areas, where is not. And you only have a certain amount of money to live with. Mm-hmm. So you're going to go based off your income. Absolutely. Right? So I moved into Par- Sparkle City which was one square mile. So that means from one angle, from one end of the city to the other end, there were a few thousand people that live in this one mile vicinity. So it's like people piled upon people, literally crabs in a bucket. That's where I grew up in. And that's where I went to the, the private school. However, the private school system was not much better than the public school system. It was just more of that, hey, I gotta pay for this. Mm-hmm. And we talk about God. But um, you still, you still get into fights. You're still doing arguments. You're still doing drugs and all that. 
And at this time, were both your parents in your life? Both my parents were in my life. Okay. So, you know, phys physically, yes, but I would say emotionally, I, I recognize that there's an emotional department that, that wasn't fulfilled okay. there. So physically, yeah, my parents were there, but it's like, hey, you still grew up on your own because because your parents are physically there doesn't mean that they're there. So why do you feel that they weren't there emotionally or there was no connection? Was it because they worked too much or? I, I, don't, I don't think it had anything to do with work because once you, once you become someone who, who's connected, then work has nothing to do with, mm -hmm. work has nothing to do with it. You're connected regardless of whether you're at work, whether you're at home. So it really had to do with their upbringing, mm. and there was no connection in their home, so they didn't know how to connect with their own kids. So I can be in the same room with you and be totally disconnected. Absolutely. Yeah, right? that's true. And, I, and I've experienced that a lot. So do you feel like it was a lack of affection? <clears throat> lack of affection, lack of, of, of awareness, lack of, mm. of internally knowing the person that you're in bed with, or lack of internally knowing the person that is in your own home or that you reside with. Mm. So how'd you deal with that? I didn't know any better. Mm. So all I knew was that, so when I became an adult, essentially I became disconnected. I was disconnected. I didn't go deep and I had to figure out why do I, why am I amongst so many people now, but I still feel alone. Mm. Is there anything that you did to cope with that? Or what's something that's different now about you that you don't feel alone? Um, so what I did to cope with that back in the day was I was always in the streets. I was always running around the block. Um, I wasn't. I was typically never home, mm -hmm. and I felt more family with friends, family with my friends' parents because they knew how to connect. They and it was that simple as like, "How's your day going? <laughs> what's Absolutely. going on in your life? Yeah. Well, what's what's challenging with you? And let's just, let's discuss it." Okay, that's that's the connection that I was looking for. Um, that that feeling of love. So I got that from my friends who cared, mm -hmm. um, who I believe cared. I got that from my friends' parents. So I, I spent most of my days outside of my own home trying to find connection, trying to, trying to feel love. We can definitely relate to that because we definitely. kind of bounced around from friend to friend, family to family. Most of our friends had their parents together, and it was always that. We were, it was, we were trying to fill that void. Yeah. So I can definitely relate to you on that one. So Andy, you're in private school at Rhode Island. Can you take us back to 13 years old? Because I know at 13 you faced some adversity. So, so I graduate private school. This is eighth grade. Graduate private school, and I'm getting ready to go to high school. Instead of going to private high school, I got the opportunity to go to public. Okay. I guess there was there was it was a the, my parents were convinced that I had enough uh, foundation. I guess from the private school mm -hmm. about religion that it could support me into private into in the, in the in the public school arena. So at 13, one of the adversities that is part of my story is at 13 going to high school. The summer going to high school, I started feeling more like a man, right? You start going through puberty, right, so right. on and so forth. So I remember like yesterday, I got a text message and a call to come out, let's like sing out. And I never wore a white, never wore a white t-shirt. Mm -hmm. Because wearing a white, <coughs> wearing a white T-shirt would show my my man boobs mm -hmm. uh, much more than a black shirt would. So I never wore white, but I always wanted to wear white. I wanted to experience that way. I want to wear a white shirt. I went downstairs and I put on a white shirt and I could see my man boobs. So I'm I'm going through my mom's uh, laundry and I find what what they call a girdle. It looked to me looked like a tube top. Mm -hmm, it was mm -hmm. it was a, a tube a tube shaped uh, basketball short feeling nylon stretchy stretchy thing that was really tight kind of like slims you down in a way yeah right? like you put it on and it slims you down so some women wear it like for their stomach if their stomach is like protruding mm -hmm. a little bit so i put it on and i put it on my chest area and it flattened my chest and i put my shirt over and i said oh shoot like yo my chest is like kind of looks normal i feel normal for the first time in my life and so i wore that out and then i say yo the next day i can't because it made my it made me feel confidence. I'm around walking around with a big chest. I'm like, what's up, man? You know, what's, what's, what's going on? And, and and no one noticed anything. No one noticed a difference. But I noticed a difference where I just felt better. So I put that on the next day. And then I said, at what point do you feel good? And do you 
you want to go back? Do you make a decision to go back and, and feel insecure? Well, at what point do you, is it on a Monday? Is it like on, like, like on a Friday? Is it when you turn? So I wore that thing every single day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, January, February, March, April, for five years straight, from 13 oh, to 19. Every single day. Did you sleep in it as well? No, I didn't sleep in it. So it was more of the, that thing is like when I'm alone, mm -hmm. I can I can take it off. So that was like my big yeah, secret. Yeah, yeah. That was like my huge. My and you huge. hit it from everyone for five years. Well, I ended up getting caught like by my mom. I don't know, maybe three or four years in. How'd that happen? Um, it was around. The, it was about the time where I started selling dope, and so I started like maneuvering about my house a little <laughs> different yeah and you know closing the door more often hiding so she knew something was going on she just didn't know what it was so she goes into my room and she's like she's like i'll do your laundry i was like okay okay oh wait, wait no 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 don't 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 do my laundry i got it i got it i'll do my laundry and i'm thinking like that's enough that she'll just oh, walk, sure. walk away yeah. she's like oh okay all right <laughs> and then so she ends up doing my laundry and then um so she's trying to find out what's going on. So she, she, as far as like, why am I hiding things? So she just ends up cleaning it and putting it on my bed and just leaving it there and walking away. She didn't say a word. She didn't say a word. She just cleaned it, put it on my bed. And I saw, I went to my room and I saw it and I was like, fuck. Because in my house, I felt comfortable to, to not have to wear it. Mm -hmm. So I didn't wear it at, my, at home. So maybe like on a Saturday morning where... I'm just at home and I just got to go outside to go do something. Um, I won't wear it, but when I'm in the public eye or at school, I wear it. Um, to the gym, I, I would wear it, things of that nature. So think about it. To, I go to the gym, I have this huge insecurity. I wear it, I sweat in it, then I have to wash it. Of course. Then I, I'm constantly in this cycle of wearing it, washing it, wearing it, washing it. And most people wash their laundry once a, once a week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was washing that thing every day. So it becomes a part of your lifestyle. That, that thing, point. if it had a camera, it would have documented the first time I drove a car. <laughs> it would have documented the first time I had sex. It would have documented the first time, the, the times I was playing basketball in the hood, in the streets. It would have documented uh, going out with my friends. It would have documented the first time I got, I smoked weed. It would have documented the first time, yeah. like, like everything. It would have documented traveling out of state with friends to vacation they would have documented everything yeah now Andy I do have to ask you because you're sharing with us a big insecurity that you did face someone at home who's watching this right now and they're going through that insecurity yes. what's something that you can share to them well that's why I do share it because um, on my social media I became vulnerable I shared it and a group of people said yo I had the same thing man I got this really? and, that, and that's why I was telling you guys that how important it is to share your story is because once I put it out there, there's a group of people that like, gonna that, that are going to gravitate and be attracted to that story and say, I suffer from the same thing. And I didn't have anyone to look up to when I, when I was going through this situation. I felt very alone. And once I became a person of significance that had influence, mm -hmm. I wanted to share that part. For the first two years of my public branding business or my, my, the public figure, the first two years of this, I didn't share that because it was too vulnerable. But it wasn't until I built the confidence to say, you know what, I got to do it be outside of me, recognizing that there's somebody out there. So a couple of people, and, I, and one in particular reminded me of myself, this dude from Florida, I never met the guy in person. His image on Instagram uh, completely, it was like a, a cartoon character. Okay. And his, his page was private with zero photos. So, but he, he was, he was, he was an avid, you. avid, like into my content, you know, messaging me and my comments, all whole nine yards. Then I started talking to him on social media that doesn't want to give his number, that wants, like, really timid. So I started sharing, like, yo, bro, like, it's okay. Like, it, it's all right. Not only is it, for you, for, is it okay for you, but there's a group of people behind you that are looking up to you, mm -hmm. whether you know it or not. Now his photo is shown. He has photos and stuff like that. Oh, because that's a, a real significant part of your life where, as a man, you don't feel like a man. You got fucking titties, bro. Mm -hmm. Like... And I, and I got made fun of for that. Do you think that's where it stemmed from? Was being bullied at 13 years old? And then you would question yourself and ask yourself, why do I have these? Yeah, I mean, the, the, way, that, the way that my chest is developed is, is uncommon 
It's uh, called gynecomastia. And it just means that I have an alar- enlargement of the, uh, the, the, the che- like my chest is enlarged, essentially mm-hmm. the fatty part of my chest mm-hmm. is enlarged. Um, so it's not as easy as another man where it's like they just lift and it gets smaller. So in the, in the beginning of my life, I thought like, yo, this was a bad thing. But I realized actually it's a great thing. It's an amazing thing because I tell you, like, first of all, like the confidence that it allowed me to, to exude about myself, mm-hmm. recognize. So when I, when I, when I, the fact I can take off my shirt and, and have this type of chest and be confident allows me to be confident in so many other areas of my life. So many other areas. That's interesting. That's really interesting. A lot of times people, they need to dip into that, that shadow side, the darkness of their life in, in order to find power. And I love that you turned something that you were insecure about into your strength. And that's very, very powerful. Yes. Yeah, the plus- and we commend you for being vulnerable, not only to us, but to everybody out there. Because I know like, there are a lot of people, a lot of kids nowadays that are still getting bullied. Yeah, so, you know, we live in a common economy where 13 year old <clears throat> could, could watch this. I hope you guys, like, take at least this part, and I want you guys to, like, separate it from the main part and just put the, con- just put the you know, man boobs, like, type, title it, like, man boobs to, to, to businessman or something like that because that's who I was looking for. So you're, you're embracing it. Oh, I'm embracing it. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. So, so I was suicidal at 13. I was touching. I had uh, baby blue walls, and it was popcorn walls. So the popcorn walls, essentially, they do something with the paint where the, the pieces of the paint stick out. Yeah. Yeah, right? So I'm 13. I'm laying down on my bed, and I'm feeling the popcorn wall. And I'm saying, yo, yo I got to kill myself, man. Like, and it's extreme, but the, the sadness of being made fun of in school, the feeling is overwhelming. And then coming home to not have anyone to talk to, it's even, it's even worse. So my parents had no idea that this shit was going on. My brother had no idea that this shit was going on. So I'm 13 with all of this <coughs> stress or, or this feeling on top of me, and it's so overwhelming. I'm thinking, like, how do I kill myself? But because I go to private school, it's more of, oh, you got to pray, pray, pray. So pray, thank God, thank God. So I didn't want to disrespect God and kill myself. So I was looking for an out. My out was looking for somebody on the internet who had the same thing but was successful. Mm. So I'm looking for people all over the internet. I can't find anyone that looks like me. You see the guy with man boobs, but it's like a guy that's like fucking, you know, 450 pounds overweight. I'm like, that's not me. So the closest main person that I got was Rick Ross, the rapper. Yeah. Right? That I could look up to. But I was like, it's not the same. It wasn't the same. And then I realized that God told me a message right then and there. He said, I want you to be that person. Mm. That's 13, 14 years old. So fast forward to, to age age twenty one or twenty two, I'm in down, I'm I'm doing a presentation. So now I'm now a speaker. I'm doing a presentation for World Financial Group, which is an insurance multi level marketing company. And um, I go after doing the presentation, I go to the bathroom, and I'm washing my hands, getting ready to leave. And I see a young dude, thirteen years old, man boobs, and he's like he he looks at me. I look at him. But I'm telling you, like, with all this confidence that I have, I can't talk to this dude. I, I get nervous to talk to this guy. He leaves. I'm like, shit, I just missed out on an opportunity to talk to him because I just wanted to see if he had the same experience that I had. Right, right. Because he has man moves as well. He goes in. We go into, I go back into the room, World Financial Group. I'm talking about I'm in an office with a bunch of different companies. <coughs> and we were in the public bathroom. He ends up going to the World Financial Group office. And I'm talking to all the men, and I'm shaking their hands. Like, and they're like, thank you so much for coming. Da, 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 da. And the father of this kid, that the kid is to his, his dad's right. And I don't even talk to, talk to them. I walk away because I'm shy. I get into my car. I, put my, I get into my car. I open up the back door, put my suit onto the seat, and then I close the door. And then the guy, the father, ends up coming out with his son. He's like, Andy, I appreciate you guys. And then I said, hey, man, let me talk to you, man. Hey, man, I see that your son has men boobs, man. I just wanted to let you know that I do, too. And I, when I was younger, I, I wore a tube top, and, you know, I had insecurity. I just wanted to see, like, if, if your son had insecurities or if it was just, like, normal. He said, wow, Andy. Opens up his car door, pulls out a bag, pulls out this tube top, 
this no light way. that's like compression short. He said, is, is it was a compression short that he got from Dick's Sporting Goods. He said, my son was just getting bullied in school. I told him he don't need this. And he's got, still got a tag on it, so he ain't wear it yet. I told him he don't need this, but but he'd been fighting for me to get it for him, so I got it for him. And I went to go talk to the little man, you know, and I said, you got someone you could look up to. I gave him a book, No More Average. Now, I haven't talked, I haven't checked up with him, and I, I'm still waiting for him to get a little bit older. But regardless to say, man, my story is going to support him as he listens to this. And he was very shy the same way I was. So me talking to him probably isn't the best way. If he's as shy as I was, it would be him finding this content online Absolutely. and saying, like, oh, shoot. Like, if the, if the, I don't know how many views you get downloads, but if this video got six views, one of them was his, and he decided to not kill himself, it will be worth it. I love that. And that's beautiful that. because it's bigger than you at this point. You're not think a lot, oftentimes we do things and we do it for ourselves, but it seems like you're coming from a place of doing it for other people, and I commend you on that, man. That's really, really big, especially being as vulnerable as you are about this situation mm -hmm. because we'll be honest, our sound engineer, her son is going through the same thing. He's getting bullied. And really bullying, bad. it's something that happens to everyone, to almost everyone. We uh, interviewed Sam back to our and for episode 10 and he was letting us know that he found that bullying was his superpower because it showed him to get out of his comfort zone and it made him stronger and it helped him evolve um, and I think that just anyone out there that's listening all of our viewers growth is good and change is good and you just always want to get out of your comfort zone yes Andy if we can take it back to your first job was it uh, Wendy's. Wendy's yeah yeah so Wendy's was um Wendy's. Okay, got it. So I, what happened was I was in school, and someone introduced me to weed. And I'm telling, I'm telling, like nowadays, like compared to weed back then, like we had sticks and seeds, and that was part of the weight. Yeah. So like you get a gram, you like <laughs> you put the gram up, you put the gram, you put it on the on the scale, and it would be, you have sticks, you have seeds, and I'm telling you, it was mid, it was Reggie. So we're talking about we're talking about like the lowest quality of weed. Yeah. And selling a gram of that with six and seeds, I mean, you're really getting high for like six minutes, you know? But, but it's not that I condone it or anything. However, I, that's what I was doing. And then I got involved with some people who were dealing with weapons. Mm. And I said, you Wrong know, crowd. Yeah, just, just, just the wrong crowd. And I, I started realizing that I was a dad. I was a person that my dad told me to be, stay away from. It was so interesting because my dad was telling me, like, Stay away from this type of people, this type of people, this type of people. And I'm like, damn, like I'm the person that he's talking about, you know. My dad, when I moved to California, and we're getting to that part. When I moved to California, my dad made a comment about like, cause, cause I, cause I moved with a friend, and my dad said, well, how is he influencing you? You know, what is he doing to influence you? And I'm like, that this guy doesn't know. He's so disconnected that he doesn't even know. Like I'm the one that said to my friend, like, let's go. I'm the one convincing people to move dope. I'm the one that's convincing people to like go to the West Coast or, or open up their business or drop out. I'm the one that's doing that. So he's like, be careful of those type of people. I'm like, damn, that's me. So, <laughs> so I realized that I don't want to go down that route of, of, of selling dope. I was paranoid. I was constantly nervous, always looking around my shoulders, uh, questioning, should I bring, bring a weapon? Should I have a weapon? Um, trying to protect myself. And then, but I was consuming content online that was pre, that was telling me that I can live otherwise and not be worried. Mm -hmm. So if, if if I realize that life is a game or business is a game, if I'm worried as a drug dealer selling dope, if I'm worried and constantly worried just so I can avoid taxes or just so I can you know be a, a be like what's the point when I can play the game of right business and recognize that okay, just a percentage of your income has to go away. Right, right. You know, a hustler is a hustler. A hustler can sell anything, right? A drug dealer is a drug dealer. You can only sell drugs. Drugs. But a hustler is a hustler. You can sell books. You can, I was selling cell phones. I was selling whatever. So I go, I wanted to experience the nine to five route. So I, my first job was Wendy's. I got a job at Wendy's. And I go into Wendy's and I'm there to really to connect with people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Connection was still a big thing for me. I'm in school, I, I feel disconnected. So I'm like, I go to Wendy's, I get a job, and the first time I feel connected because we're all 
have one common goal get this meal out of the window as fast as possible <laughs> yeah. so we're like you got the grill person over here you got the sandwich person over here you got the fry person over here you got the um the grill person handles the fry later so you got grill sandwich for a uh, fry person who hold who who's bagging it and, and doing the fries so we're working as a team and then i run the drive i run the drive through so that's the first time i feel connected connecting with people like Hey, hey, Danielle, good job. You know, like, oh, shoot. Hey, Andy, good job. You know, teamwork, right? Teamwork, teamwork. I'm like, man, it feels good. So I saved a little bit of money. I got my first car. So when did I got my first car? And how old are you, were you at that time? Uh, 16. 16. And you were still drug dealing? Uh, I, I believe I stopped. Okay. I was, I believe I stopped. 16 years old to have your first car by yourself, that's a big accomplishment. Actually, I was 15. 15? Yeah, I couldn't. I remember. Yeah, so, so I, was, I was 15. So I might, have sold dope. I might have sold dope for a short period of time. It wasn't maybe a year. And I remember that when my connect got arrested, and that's when I was like, oh, shit. Like, it's coming down the line. Yeah. You know, it's, and I was very smart, completely smart, where I understood, like, hey, this is where you're headed, dude. Like, you've seen enough. This is where you're headed. Go and do something else. Did you ever get to that point where you got arrested? No, there's so many situations where I really believe, like, I had, a, had something on me where I was like, that was not supposed. You're protected. Yeah, I was. That was not supposed to be on my record. Like I, like I knew I wasn't gonna go that, down that route. Um, so many instances where I had something on me, um, could have gotten arrested, pulled over with it. I remember one time, <laughs> this one situation. Me, <laughs> me and my boy, we went to. Um, so I, I had a '99 Honda Coupe, yeah. right? Ooh, that was cool. <laughs> right, right. So that was that was. So I, I, that's what I was whipping at the time, and my boy had. Like we had a lot of it to the point we had to put it in the trunk. So we put it in the trunk. Um, and, ah, oh shit. I, I, I go to a party that's like, you know, I want to say, you know, yo, it's so crazy now I'm thinking about it, right? The state is about this big, okay? <laughs> the state is this you big. You guys were everywhere, huh? <laughs> the state is this big. However, there's parts of the state that we just didn't go to. There's a, there's a mindset there, there's a mindset in many small towns where it's like, you literally only travel a couple of miles, like, your entire livelihood is only a couple of miles, <coughs> and, and I'm sharing that from the point of view of now living in California, mm -hmm. where it's normal to drive 50 miles to go to a party, it's normal to drive 60 miles to go to do a podcast mm -hmm. or whatever, so I did, uh, I went to a party in, in Cranston, which is literally like 12 minutes away from my city, but I'm talking about in my head. At the time, that's something far. Damn, go to Cranston? Like, what the hell you got to do in Cranston? That's where the white people live at. So I went to Cranston. We had a party there. And I, and I go to the party. I'm on my way to the party. And I do a U-turn on the main road. There's literally no one on the road. As soon as I do a U-turn, whoop, whoop, behind me. And I'm like, yo, D, yo, D that's his name. I, let's just say that's his name. So I'm like, yo, D, you got that in the car, right? He's like, yo, it's in the back. I'm like, all right, be calm. Mm -hmm. So we cop cop comes in to the door, and then he asked me for my license. I give him my, my license. Now, we don't have it in the front, so we, we can't yeah, smell yeah. it, right? D, <laughs> D's on the right. I'm like, you got, you got your ID on you? He's like, he's like, nah. I'm like, all right, don't, they shouldn't even ask you because you're not because they pulled me over, not you. Yeah. So the cop comes back and says, hey, passenger, your ID license. And he's like, why do I got to give you my name? And in my head, I'm like, all right, man. He already started off with the bad foot. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like oh, man. I'm like... I'm like, um, I'm like, yo, I'm like trying to be on the cop's side. I'm like, yo, man, give me your license. And then, <laughs> and then, and then, you know, so I'm, I'm making buddy with the cop. He's like, oh, I don't have it on me. And he's like, he's like, all right, what's your social? The cop says, what's your social? My boy is like, he, I guess he's been interacting with the cops so much that he knew not to give him the social because the cops would steal people's identities. Ooh. So he's like, I'm not going to give you my social. I'm like, all right, man. All right, who am I gonna call when I get to get bailed out? Who am I gonna call? You know, like I'm already thinking I'm going yeah. in. Fortunately, it was situations like that where the cop was like, he showed discretion, right? Um, oh yeah, exactly. He did to to allow me to to mm -hmm. essentially go. He's like, yo, you guys are fucking, you guys are fucking assholes, bro. Here, here's your here's your ID. You're fine. You're good to go. Get the hell out of here. I'm like, all right, man. I'm like, yo, thank God, man. How many times? So I feel like I had this thing, this like. The Holy Spirit was taking care of me, not allowing me to get in trouble, because it it would have it would have affected me as an adult. Absolutely, definitely, especially having your mind shaped in private school at that young of an age, because like you said, you chose not to 
fall into those suicidal thoughts due to the fact that your morality, the Bible, it teaches against that. And then at the same time, you understood that you, you can't be drug dealing because it messes with your integrity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, people will still do that even though they don't feel good inside. Well, also, be, I think, number one, I had a vision that was... That was Greater. Yeah, that my future was like... I, like it's, it's like constantly like in the future, something was going to be better for me. Mm -hmm. And I still feel like that today. So you couldn't like really pinpoint it at that time, but you knew internally that there was more for your life. Yeah. Yeah. I still like to feel like that today where like today is like there's some things I can't get involved with because I'm like, hey, man, if I get caught up with that, man, like it's going to affect who I, who I know I'm supposed to be in the future. So, so I, the way I move and sometimes I may slip up, but the way I move typically is like, hey, man. Make sure that it's in, in alignment with your future for the, for the long run. Absolutely. So, Andy, after your first job, you then went into a cell phone. You were a manager? So, so when I was working at Wendy's, I left Wendy's, and I wanted to learn how to make more money. Okay. Because at Wendy's, I was making seven forty an hour, seven forty multiply that by 40, and you only making a couple hundred bucks. So, I got a job working at Bob's. Bob's was a discount clothing store. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I learned at Bob's was that when you produce a result, you there's benefits. You get benefits. Right, right. So I was working making eight dollars an hour. So I go from seven forty to eight dollars an hour, and plus on Sundays they gave us what they call time and a half. Yeah, mm. yeah. So I was like, "Yo, Bob's is a shit because because <laughs> because I get twelve bucks on Sundays. So I'm trying to I'm trying my best to get." the Sunday hours, yeah. um, as well as I got an extra 60 cents. Mm -hmm. um, plus, I wouldn't smell like fries afterwards. Like, my biggest <laughs> pleasure, oh, man. My biggest pleasure was coming out of the off, coming out of the, the work and not smelling like fries. Mm. So, so, what happened is their goal was to give away Bob's cards. It was literally free cards, loyalty cards, those, you okay. know, you scan those to, because yeah. yeah. you remember. It was free. I was the highest producer of giving those cards away, but the manager of the store had a goal, had a comp had a store wide goal, like a quota, quota to mm -hmm. me of how many cards they gave away per transaction. Okay, and um, I was the one that was hitting the target, and I'm like, all it is is you got to ask them and convince them. So every time you scan the card, you, the company got the the person got a discount. So everybody else, all the other reps were saying, hey, would you like Bob's card? Yes or no? No? Okay, fine. I would say, hey, do you want to save 10 bucks on this today? Mm. And they would, they would say, yeah, yeah. All you got to do is sign. I put your info in. I put your info in as a customer that you bought this, and you get 10 bucks away, 10 bucks off. They're like, okay. So I'm the highest producer of these cards. Next thing you know, they're like, hey, Andy, when do you want to work? How many hours do you want this week? I'm like, I could choose. <laughs> all right, give me all Sunday. <laughs> you know, give me, I want Sunday morning to Sunday close. Done. All right. I want this register and I want to work Monday this day. I want Tuesday off and I want this day, this day. And they're like, all right, man. So I start understanding mm -hmm. that I make more when I produce a result. Mm. Next thing, I say, I want to get, make more money. So I get a job working at uh, Metro PCS selling okay. cell phones. Mm. A guy walks in. He's the owner of the company. He's black. And I'm like, yo, you're black with earrings and you own this. I work for you. I thought I worked for a Metro PCS corporate. He's like, no, you work for a dealership, mm. and I'm the dealer owner. So I own this dealership of 10 stores. I own it. And I'm like, yo, my boss is black. This <laughs> is crazy. He's not corporate. <laughs> this is crazy. I didn't know black people can own businesses. I mean, think about it. He's like, you're like 18, 17 years so old. So it was the first time that you were exposed to that. Yeah. Now, let me take it back just a little bit. So you... From 13 to 19, you were going through that insecurity phase, right? You were still yeah. wearing the girdle, okay? So work, working at cell phone? That, working at a cell phone company. Working at... Work, work. Would you say that you were still experiencing those insecurities during that time when you started working, you started learning how to sell? And if so, how did you overcome that negative mindset and that negative self-talk? I still wore those... I still wore that, that thing because I, I remember it like going... Now, here's what happened. It started loosening it up. Mm. It was super tight, like, super tight. I mean, after four years of, like... Because doesn't it eventually swim slim you down as well? Uh, no. Nah. Oh, no, those are waist trainers, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah waist <laughs> trainers, yeah. It didn't slim me down. It just held everything together. Mm -hmm. And it started, it started stretching. That material started stretching. You, know, you, you go to the... I go swimming with it. 
the chlorine, the bleach, it's all up in there, you know? So it started loosening, and what it did, it formed like a cup. It's like a, mm. It was more like a cup on my chest like this now. Instead of be, being flat, it was like a cup. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, I had to be like conscious about the clothes that I was wearing, selling cell phones. So now I'm, now I'm selling cell phones, and, um, but I'm a hustler still. I have this mentality of producing results financially or, 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 or getting what it is that I want by any means, whatever it takes. So I, now my job is to sell cell phones. I become the highest, highest uh, sales rep in the company. And I'm 18 years old at the time. And it's, it's 10 locations, so mm-hmm. it's about 50 people that work in this company now. And they're like, what the hell? This 18-year-old is selling the most phones. It doesn't make sense. How are you selling the most phones? You know what? We got to put you in position. They put me as a manager of the slowest store. The wow. slowest store. Now, granted, the slowest store was headquarters. So, in, fr- in the front was an actual store where customers walk in. In the back okay. was the where they did payroll, <clears throat> inventory, where the CEO kind of came in and was like making his decisions. It was interesting. And I'm going to share this story with some of the podcasts. You may want to split this up into segments. Absolutely. But the... So I, I got the job working at Metro PCS. They put me into a training store. The training store was one of the busiest stores. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So let's call that store one. Okay. The busiest store. Now, the biz, being in the busiest store, there's a lot of activity coming in. The manager is there. The, the, I got a couple of co-workers. So they got like five people working at the store, plus me. I'm sick. So it's fun. Right. I get to hang. Oh, let's order pizza today. You know, let's, oh, okay, fun, great. Customer after customer after customer after customer. And then the, re- so that was my training period. That was me training to learn how to work in the business, work in the cell phone business, um, how to use the computers and so on. Then the regional manager comes in who's running my store. Who He says, hey, Andy, we're going to bring you down to store 10. Bring okay. you to store 10. I was like, yeah, I'll go, I'll go work at store 10. What you need? You need me to work there a day? I remember, Rob, what you need me to do? Like work there like a day? And he's like, he's like no, no, no. All right, I worked there for a week, you know, as, as you transition yeah. for that per- to get that person to replace that person that quit. And he looks at me, he's, he calls me on the phone as we're talking. He's like, no, I need you to transfer there. I'm like, dude, you need to transfer? I felt comfortable at store one. I had my friends there. I had all these customers. I had a customer base. You already established. I was already established. I mean, this is only a couple of months of working, but I'm established to like, I feel comfortable. That's the main point. I feel comfortable. He pulls me to store 10. Store 10, there's barely any customers. You get one or two customers a day. Plus, the, 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 the owner of the company is in the back. So you're always on point. Yeah, you're yeah, always like, yeah. hello, sir. You know, you're always <laughs> on point. So I had to get uncomfortable. And they put me there without... So if I had, I made my, had I made the choice, I would have stayed comfortable. But they, put me in my, they, they moved me out of my comfort zone. By them doing that, now in order for me to make money, I got to go get customers. Mm. So they pay me $8 an hour, but I know I can make more if I go get customers because I get commission. So I put out signs outside. Let's see how that works. I, I'm going outside doing this. Now, instead of me working with a group of people, I'm the only one in the store. So I go and get customers, and I'm like, hey, why don't you come into the, into the store? I put signs outside. I'm going to the bank. I'm like, hey, guys, my name is Andy Ardate. I, I'm working at Metro PCS. Tell your people to come see me. Tell your people to come see me. And um, the customers start coming in. I turned that store from number 10 to number five. Whoa. So we increased, I increased Huge sales jump. and I made the money. So the managers, I mean, this is all happening within a year's time, what I'm sharing with you. The, the, one of the leaders of the company comes up to me and says, hey man, what did you think about running a store? I'm like, what does that, what does that entail? Why don't you actually go show other reps how to make more money? Let's put you up in, uh, in a mall. So that, num- that number, 10 store ends up, so the company grew and that, that 10 became five and then the amount of stores went from 10 to 20. So mm-hmm. the company grew during this time. So when I'm running, the company's 20 stores deep, we got 100 and probably like 100, probably got 100 employees now. The new store that they put me in is now the lowest producing store, mm-hmm. it's in the mall. I gotta go do the same thing. I gotta go get customers, bring them back. It's like rinse and repeat. Rinse basically. and repeat, however, now I got a team. So I got people age 35, 30, 40 working for me. I got to show them how to sell. I'm 18 years old. 18 years old. 18, That's impressive. 18 years old. Think about it. I, I'm, a lot co- of pressure, I'm, co- I'm coming in. I didn't wear suits back then, but I'm coming with a, I'm thinking business, polo, yeah, yeah. tucked in. 
So that's why I wore it. So they're probably me. looking at you and be like, who's this chump trying know. to tell me what to do? Yeah, why the hell am I working for an agent? <laughs> and then, and then um, that's, that's, it went from Wendy's to Metro PCS, selling phones, and then um, then I opened up my own store, actually, with Metro PCS. And is that when you ended up moving to California? No, so I'm, I'm 19. I think I'm 19 at this time, or just turned 19. I'm working out with with one of my sales reps that I work at Metro PCS. Okay. He actually happened to go to high school with me as well. So I gave him a job because I was a manager at that mm-hmm. store. And he, we were working out, and he said, hey, man, I believe in you to open up your own store. Why don't you open up your own store? And he said, okay. I, I, said, I said, okay, after overcoming fear, doubt, and insecurity. Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um, I, I told him, I was like, I'm 19. I'm overweight. College dropout. How can I be successful? And he said, I believe in you, man. So I took that leap of faith. And um, I have a system in my bank account, which I want to give value to your audience. I have a system in my bank account that allowed me to open up that business. So it, 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 I knew the numbers cost about $6,000 to open up a store, right? Mm-hmm. With barely any inventory. Just really just rent. Just to get you started, Just to right? get me started, yeah. So it cost about 6000 I told him, I said, hey, man, I'll get the $3,000 if you get the 3000 and um, he didn't have the three thousand. He thought he did. He didn't have the three thousand. So I was thinking, like, I'm not gonna have. We're not gonna open the store because I won't have the money. Then I remembered I have the system where I hide my bank account, mm. so I don't even see my bank account. So I have my main bank account that yeah, you need food, go to Walmart, you know, right, whatever right. your expenses, your expenses, living expenses. Your, your living expenses. But out of my my check. What I did when I got the job was I routed a percentage of my, my, my you deposit. Can do that today. You could do that, yeah, to another account that I didn't see. So all this time, I get 500 I didn't even realize it. I'm thinking it's taxes, but I get, two, <laughs> I get $200 deposit. I'm like, where the hell did the $300 go? But I never actually like, did my accounting. Or put I, two and two together, right? Yeah, I'm just a hustler. So I'm just focused on, like, I did, I, I did a result, boom, got paid, got, got paid, got paid. So I'm like, so I thought it was taxes. So all this money is going into my, my hidden bank account. And then I'm laying down one day and I'm like, hey man, I need, I, where am I gonna get this money from? I need, I need $7,000, $6,000, where am I gonna get this money from? And I said, oh shoot, I got that money in that account. So I go to that account, like, I'm like, yo, how much is in that account? They're like, yo, we got, so you got $7,000 that you saved up. No I'm way. like, yo, I got seven grand? All right, bet, pull up, give me the money <laughs> before you guys make, figure out your mistake. <laughs> so I took my money. I opened up my first store. That first store did a hundred, did six grand the first month. Wow. I was des- I was scared because six grand after paying all the expenses, I got like, I got like forty bucks. You know, I got like I I ended up. I remember I had enough for a sub at a subway upstairs. So I didn't I didn't make enough money. Six grand wasn't a lot. See, there's no profit out of it. There was no there was no profit. So the next month we ended up doing a little bit better, and it was constant progression. I in in six months I looked at the math. And I said, okay, now by December, so it was June to December. By December, I'm way better off. Okay. Right? I got a, a real business. I'm actually ready to open up a second location. And I look at how much money came in, $106,000. So that $106,000 had a profit. I said, oh, shit. Can I do a million? Within the, last, within, the next, uh, within the next year, I did a million. Now I had a shit ton of profit. Out of that profit is what I took to move to California. And you were 19. Uh, I was 21 by this time. So at 19, I started the business. Within a year and a half, I was 21. Man. And, and Andy, I know in your story, you always had, at a point, you had Les Brown in your ear. And you were listening to Les Brown. Was this when you were working out with your coworkers, or when did you get into um, Les Brown? Yeah, this was, this was in high school. In high school, I was listening to personal development, learned about Les Brown, learned about Eric Thomas. 2014, I remember being in the parking lot of my college. So... So 2014 is when I opened up the business at 19. So I was right before I dropped out of college, I was listening to Eric Thomas, and Eric Thomas is the motivational speaker. And oh, I was gee. thinking That's about great. it. It's crazy like like we're in a magazine now and stuff like we're doing stuff together. Did but you ever think that would happen? No, I, I I had no idea. I had no idea because, but now I'm thinking about it. It's like I'm that person for some other people. Like how they listen to my podcast, they listen to this. It's not I'm that person for other people. But back then, I was listening to Eric Thomas, recognizing that this college route wasn't for me. I got a, I got a boss that is teaching me real business, that is like showing me what it's really like. And I'm in college trying to learn business from a guy who 
doesn't even own a business. Doesn't own a business, <laughs> making forty thousand yeah. dollars a year, and you could tell like, he hates his job. All right, guys. Today we're going to talk about yeah. uh, Maslow's hierarchy, and we're going to talk about the, <laughs> the psychological needs, uh, the physiological needs of the human body, just so you can understand uh, leadership. It's a textbook. It's like, yeah, it's like, dude, that shit don't work. I don't know if it does, but hey, man, I'd rather learn from James. So I, so I left, dropped out of college. Went, to, and it's funny. Those guys were telling me to drop out of college. The, the owner of that company. Because I mean, you're really going to get the most experience by doing, right? By implementation, by action. So recently, literally, I'm talking about like two months ago, um, I went back to the East Coast and I went back to my manager that told me to drop out of college. And I said, hey, man, I want to let you know. I appreciate you for letting me know. Damn. I thought you were telling me to drop out of college <laughs> so I could work for you. And um, but he was like, nah, dude, I told you that a while ago. I said, thank you for telling me because college was teaching me how to be a part of a system. They created a system and they were subconsciously telling me yeah, this is how you be part of a system. What they were trying to do. And in the cell phone store, they were trying to teach me how to hustle and get mine. How do you kill a lion? How do you get, end up in the jungle and come out feasting with food? How do you do that? College can never teach me that. What college could teach me is how do you take the meal that is given to you? Mm -hmm. I want to learn how to kill a lion. Damn, that's powerful. that's powerful. That is deep. All right, so I hear you're a big power fan. So oh, shit, yeah, yeah, yeah. I am a huge fan, man. Huge fan of Ghost. So we got to take it back. The Suits. The Suits. Were you inspired because of him? Uh, not, <laughs> not, not because of Ghost, but Ghost is the type of person in that TV show Power by 50 Cent. Ghost is the type of person that I wanted to be. The ghost, like, like, I'm talking about the... the, the respect. The, the, the respect, the ways of being, like, you don't smile too much. And that's how I started. As a boss, that's, how, that's who I saw. Mm -hmm. but, I re but I realized in the real world, man, that actually turned my employees away. So I had employees where they feared me. It, mm. it wasn't that they really respected me. They feared me. And they yearned for the experiences that I smiled and like hung out with them. I could tell like they were just yearning. Like, like why, when, I, when I would smile and we would kick it, they were like, oh my gosh, like this is the time. <laughs> like I would take my employees to Applebee's because of the cell phone store we had. I had 14 people working for me. So I would take them to Applebee's, like the, the core team, and we would go hang out, and they were like, yo, this is Andy. Like, this is a dope party. <laughs> he's a Andy. cool guy. Yeah, he's, he's, actually, he's actually cool. I've always heard that from employees. Like, he's actually cool. <laughs> but the, go, the type of person that goes is where it's like serious, on the money, on point, in a suit, well-respected. That's exactly who I, I emulated to be. And that's great because you're now an author and a motivational speaker. And how did that come to be? Because I know the suit came before that. And how did you get into, into just motivational speaking in general? So I got introduced to wearing a suit by my assistant. She was in, all into fashion. So we went to Macy's and then what? So I would take like the, so, so it started off small where I was working the stores and then I grew it to, to four locations. Now we had all these employees, so I got an office. And my assistant worked in the office. So she started working on the sales floor and then she worked, she ended up working into the office where she was doing the numbers and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I would take her out of the office, we would go visit the stores. And we were in one of the malls and she brought me up to Macy's and she said, try this blazer on. So I tried a blazer on, I was like, oh shit, boom. Damn. <laughs> and, and then, so that, that's how I got introduced to the suit. What was the question again? I was saying because th there's a parallel between wearing a suit, we were talking about proximity before the podcast yeah. and how you want to be around. You are the average of the five people you hang out with and right, you right. want to rub shoulders with the Lamborghinis and the Ferraris. You got into wearing that suit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so into... she, she, she showed it to me. She introduced me to it, but I wasn't really wearing it. Mm -hmm. And nor was I wearing a tie back then. I didn't wear a tie until I came to California. Oh. So, so I left, I left the, closed down the business, moved to the West Coast, and th this street right here is called Figueroa Street. Mm -hmm. So three years ago, I was living across the street um, and the same type of complex where we got the pool, jacuzzi, all that stuff. So I was living there and I wanted to lose some weight. Mm -hmm. So I went out on the street, started running. And I said, the, the, to do it by myself wasn't as effective, wasn't effective. So I, got a, I saw a coach, like a trainer in the, uh, in the gym where we work out. So I asked him, I said, hey, would you train me? He said, yeah. So he charged me a rate to, tra to get training. So I got training from him. Wake up at five o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning, and I would go out and run. And one day on a run, 
I was listening to Les Brown. Les Brown was sharing a story and I visually saw it where I escaped from my run. My legs are moving, but in my mind, I'm in this experience that he's sharing. And I said, yo, I want to do that to somebody else to be able to share my story and have people escape. Mm -hmm. Number two, I see myself speaking on stage with Les Brown. I literally, on this one run, saw myself on stage with the number one motivational speaker, Les Brown. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I didn't know where it came from, but I saw myself doing that. I went home. I typed in how to be, I remember, I'm, in, I'm still sweating. How do, I, how do I become a motivational speaker? I'm on my counter. I see Les Brown's ad that's now is following me on Facebook. It like happened instantaneously. I put my information on their website. Next thing you know, they call me. So I'm calls me the next day. They pitched me the program. It's 5000 to to join a course, mm-hmm. an online course, which was nine modules. A nine module course for 5000 bucks. I said, this is fucking ridiculous. This is a lot of money. I've never spent anything over $5,000 besides my car and my business. How can I spend that much money on a course? And the guy convinced me and closed me because I was comparing it to a $197 course. And I realized, like, yo, which one am I going to choose? I chose the $5,000 course. I went to Miami, saw Les Brown. I went to Miami and recognized, like, oh, shoot, Les Brown's there. I see him. And I say, Les, I, you're in person. And he looks, touches me and says, you have something on your face. And I, th- <laughs> I thought, I, and, he, and he says, you look like me when I was younger. He touches my face. And I said, Les, like your voice, it sounds like YouTube. And he's like, yeah, <laughs> all right, man, I'm going to get out of here. So he left. I overheard him talking to the president about them going on tour. I went back and forth to them. And I said, hey, give me an opportunity to go on tour. After seven times, they said no. But on the seventh time, they said yes. You're so six relentless, times, right? Six, six times they said no. I kept on going back. Six times they said no. On the seventh time they said yes. And they gave me the opportunity to go on tour. What kept you going after that first no? Listen, man. When you want something, by any means, whatever it takes, go and get it. Uncomfortability is part of the situation. Damn. It's part of it. But it's going to show you how powerful you are. Don't let anything get in your way. Nothing. Not a person, not a door, not a wall, not a car. Not, there's no human being more powerful than you. There's nothing that's more powerful. So when I recognized that my mom, like I saw my mom being taken care of on the other side of me going on this tour because I recognized that proximity is power, that my dad was going to be taken care of, that my family was going to be taken care of. What the hell is a no? I'm like, he just doesn't understand this yet. So experience-wise, so you can visualize, I walk into the office and I say, give me an opportunity. And I have to explain to myself, the president's like, <laughs> all right, man, I need you to get out, get out of the office. Like, I'm busy. I'm like, okay, I'll come back. I came back the next day. Like, give me an opportunity. Same thing. No. I had to go back to my LA. So I'm in LA. The company had conference calls mm-hmm. with all the students, about 500 people mm-hmm. on this conference call. They go through their training on this conference call, and at the end you can ask questions. So I press star six to ask questions. So now it says, you have been unmuted. Ask your question. So I say, hey guys, hey, question for you. Hey man, I need to get on this tour, man. What I gotta do to to get on this tour? You have been muted. And then it's like, hey, we'll answer your question later. And they muted me. It's like, I was constantly relentless. But the reason for that is because I recognize what it is that I wanted. By any means, whatever it takes, I'll get it. You wanna go after it. Yeah. So, okay, so what advice would you give someone who is hungry, passionate, they're seeking a mentor, however, they are lacking the capital? P-A-W. Persistence always wins. No matter what you want, persistence always wins. You can get it by any means, whatever it takes. That's bandwidth. By any means, whatever it takes. But persistence, you will win with persistence. Because the human, the human mind understands that when you desire something, the other human mind that, that's working with you says, yo, I recognize that this person really wants it. I, there's been a time in my life that I really wanted it. And I can give this person what they want. And I want to see this person happy. So I'll give it to that person. So what I mean by that is if person A is trying to get my attention, Andy's attention, and person B is trying to get my attention, the person that's like, hey, Andy, I keep seeing them pop up, show up, that's the person I'm going to give my attention mm-hmm. to. Not the person that says, hey, hey, can I get your time for a podcast? Or 
hey, can you mentor me? Or, hey, can I spend time with you? Just by once. You know, if they ask yeah, me yeah. once, then I'm not going to... Of course. I'm not going to bend for that person. But it's the other one that's actually going to put forth the action. Or the effort, yeah. Now, Andy, I know that you're helping people take control of their mindset and you're helping them reach peak performance. Can you tell the viewers at home a little bit about No More Average? No More Average essentially is a book about changing your proximity, changing your environment. Because I started recognizing that on the East Coast, when I hung around drug dealers, what did I become? A drug dealer. Drug dealer. When, I, when I started hanging around with bosses and executives, what did I become? A business owner. So recognizing that, when I moved to California and I started hanging out with people who had more money, what did ultimately happen? I made more money. So in this book, I talk about to really change, the number one thing that you must do is change your environment. Mm. You can't be in the environment, you can't get cured in the environment that you got sick in. So change your environment so you can experience the wins that you want to experience. That is great. Can you talk to us a little bit about the five forms of currency? The five forms of currency it's something that I learned when I came to California about what it is that people want. Thinking that what people really wanted was money, but recognizing that people don't want money. They want what money can get them. So if you, can, if you don't have money, to answer your question about the money part, if you can get people what they want without the money, like if you can skip the money part, you can literally get what it is that you want. Mm-hmm. So there's five forms of currency. Number one, the most common currency is money, cash. Mm-hmm. Number two, another currency that we have is relationships. So I can buy something from you with cash, or I can introduce you to the right person and you can recognize that this is more valuable than whatever it is that you're going to give me. So relationships. Then you have um, energy. Wendy's didn't pay me to, to our, you know, they didn't pay me for my time. People get that confused. They pay me for my energy. Andy, flip the burger. Boom. That's what I'm paying yeah, you for. Yeah, absolutely. So they pay me for energy. So you got money, relationship, energy. Then you got barter. Barter is the... Uh, exchange. Exchange of a product or product or like or service or service. Last one, I was doing a um, last currency. I was doing a uh, a a movie for Dame Dash. Dame Dash mm-hmm. is the um, business partner for Jay Z that started Rockefeller. Rockefeller, right? Yeah. So I'm doing a movie with Dame, and I just got off set. I go into Walmart, and I'm laughing, and they're like, "Hey, the, the, I grabbed some like Gatorade and some snacks," and the guy asked me, "Hey, man, um, what?" Why are you so happy? I was like, I just got off set, dude. We got a movie coming out. And he was like, he was like, how do I get on set? Like, how do I become, like, you're black, I'm black. How do I, how do, I do that? And I said, there's five forms of currency. I told him all the currencies that I told you. And he says, but you told me four. So I, I'm still missing one. I haven't told you yet. So he's like, can you tell me that one? I said, yeah, but give me these chips for free. He said, I can't. There's a camera right here. I'm going to get in trouble <laughs> if I give you the chips. And I and he said, I said, well, you're not gonna know the currencies then. He said, I probably really want to know it. I said, give me the chip. <laughs> he said, all right, man. You know what? Scanned it, took the money out of his wallet, put money into the draw, Smart. and then he gave me the chips. And I said, knowledge. The last currency is knowledge. When I don't, when I know something that you don't know, and you really want to know it, you'll be willing to pay for it, like you just did. You'll be willing to put up your relationships and all the other currencies. So money. Relationships, barter, energy, and knowledge. Five currencies. Yeah, you all heard it first. Well Five. said. Yep, there you go. Well said. So, Andy, here <laughs> at the Unbreakables, what we like to do is we have a little magical deck. We don't believe in coincidence. <laughs> we feel like everything happens for a reason. We want you to pick two questions. If you don't feel comfortable asking them, you can always go on to the next question. All we ask is two. So you can read both of them out loud and then Why don't answer you them it? accordingly. Well, all right, D. So the question is, if you had only one hour left to live, how would you spend it? I would write down a letter for the world. Mm. What would and, be in that letter? And this, was, this would probably be in a real quiet setting by myself. And I would be sitting at a table and I would be thinking the world and I would say it was a pleasure spending time with you. Um, you probably see that by the time that the letter was found, that on the bottom left, that there was a, there was a circle that was crunched up. And the reason why, because a tear fell and um, it dried up as well. So it looked like you know a circular tear that was once there. 
And on this letter, it would share with the world about, really about moving forward with your vision and not being scared. And realizing that at this point that I'm at right now, where I'm about to die, is um, the ultimate point to be at. And that there's no, there's nothing that could stop you. There's nothing that is stronger than you. That recognizing that fear is fake and it's made, it's, it's made up in your mind. And that you have to go after your goals. And the reason why is because at the point that I'm currently at right now where I'm about to, I'm about to die is the place you don't, you're not at. And if you recognize that you're not at this point, that means there's nothing worse than being at this point. So if you recognize that you're once going to be at this point of death, you might as well go big right now. You might as well go all in. The government can't stop you. No opposition can stop you. The devil can't stop you. But you. So that's what that would be a was on the story. How do you challenge yourself? Proximity is power. I love it, man. The proximity that I get to, to the people that I'm around is the people that I'm always I'm constantly around other people that, that take me to the next level. So I currently work out now with Marines and uh, people that are on stage. Um, I'm, I make the least amount of money in my circle. I'm the youngest in my circle. Um, I have the, the worst body in my circle. Um, but I elevate my circle's mindset. And I show them how powerful that they are. It's a 5 a.m. club, huh? <laughs> no, 5, 5 a.m., I'm already on my way back home. Yeah. So so we have, the, we have a 4 a.m. club where we work out. So I'm up by 3 on the weekdays. And um, so getting around the right circle, challenging myself, challenging my mind, because I've experienced it, what it's like to be the, 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 the king in my circle. I've experienced that. And that's where you're not, you don't feel growth. I didn't feel growth. I feel like, man, I'm taking this whole group of people on my back. Right, right. You know, so I'm 14, 18, 19 years old. 18, think about it. 18, I'm a manager. I'm managing people now. I'm teaching other people. So, so it started at a young age, 18, 19, 20. It's been, I'm always bringing people. So how do I channel myself is by getting around other people that are elevated as yourselves, like you're with Arte, getting other people that are elevated and saying, getting around them and saying, hey, how do I elevate to that level? And recognizing that once I meet the elevation, then there's going to be another group of people that I got to mm-hmm. elevate with. Nice. Okay. So what does success... And what does progression look like for you? Progression, progression. What, prog- what progression means is to work towards the better version of yourself on a daily basis. And in these four areas of life, you have fitness, you have finance, you have faith, and you have family. And recognizing that you get to grow in any in all of these areas of life. That's what progression means. So progression means taking care of my family. From for my life is taking care of my family. I want to retire my mom and uh, bring it to the West Coast, as well as my dad and my little brother. Uh, my, fi- my finances are going to be a result of doing all this stuff that I'm doing right now with supporting other people in their businesses. So my finances are going to grow. Um, I'll be hitting the billion dollar mark by 27 in revenue. Then, and it, it's going to be astronomical how I do it. It's kind of like, it's kind of like how the, um, the, the businesses like I've opened, I, I don't know how I've opened it, how I made it work, but something's gonna be there. That's I'm gonna end up hitting the billion dollar mark by 27 and being Forbes by 29. Then I, my faith, getting closer to God, mm-hmm. and then you know just ha- just taking having fun with my family and friends and taking care of my body. Now, awesome. if you can choose one, not both, what would you rather have, success or fulfillment? Success. I mean, they go hand in hand. You know, it's like. It's something, it's something that goes hand in hand. You know, what would you rather have, the camera or the lens? Well, definitely. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but I, I would mean, say fulfillment is success. When you reach yeah, fulfillment, that, you are successful. Andy, I do have to ask you, you are the creator of the Progression Conference. You're, yeah. you're teaching people strategies. You're giving them systems. Can you share with our viewers at home a little bit about the conference and why they should come attend it? Yeah, so we're going on a national tour in 2020. But the Progression Conference is, is, is really... The, the Progression Wireless, the cell phone company, Progression Wireless, the idea behind Progression Wireless was it was a filtration system for the hood that as people worked for me, they would end up, 
And I, I did this on purpose where I play like Alexa Brown and Eric Thomas in the mm-hmm. background mm-hmm. in the office and stuff like that, hoping that it would dissect and <laughs> go into that mindset. Marinate so, a little bit. Yeah, so people would come in and work for me, and then they would leave with a mindset that was like different out of this world. So my idea was that I was going to open up all these stores, and literally 18, 16, 17 people were going to come work for me, and then they would leave with a different mindset. And our, our, our tool to fund this project was essentially mm-hmm. the cell phones and money. I realized that I can't change people. In the book, I tell you the story of why. But I realized that I can't change people. I can only help people help themselves. Mm. You know, you can't change someone that doesn't want to be changed. You, you can't, you know. So, so when I moved to California, the Progression Conference came about when I realized that the people are going to come into this and learn how to make more money so they can experience freedom for, with their family. And it's the people that are going to come in that want the support, that want the help that want to go to the next level and that desire that, that they'll come to this one day event. I bring them mentors in my circle. I'm talking about mentors who started businesses from zero, now doing $12 million in a month. Uh, that go from zero to making other people rich. That go from zero to expand. And it's, it, is it all revolved around money? Yes. And the reason why is because I don't know how many people are happy broke. I don't know. When I was broke, I could not tell you a day that I was happy. Why? Because I can smile, but always in the back of my yeah. mind, it's like, I got to pay that bill. Always in the back of my mind, you're scared that something's going to happen. If this happens, man, like you don't have the money to take care of it. You know, I've had that, those situations where I'm driving my car and I'm like, yo, if the tire pops, I don't even have the this 200 bucks to get it fixed or whatever. So that's not happiness if you're constantly in fear. So let's alleviate that part. I'm going to support and alleviate that part. When people come through the Progression Conference, they experience how to make more money. There you have it, guys. If you guys haven't heard of the Progression Conference, I want you guys to follow Andy Aday. Where can they find you at on Instagram, So go For the Progression Conference, go to progressionticket.com, progressionticket.com, and then find me on Instagram at Andy Aday. But two days ago, we had the Progression Conference, Los Angeles. You were there. Mm -hmm. Share with me your experience there. It was a great experience. Um, A lot of many different speakers, and I took my partner. It was a great time. Great networking opportunity. You had EJ, you had Joe Coach, you had Mike Taylor, you had a bunch of different speakers. So it was nice, a lot of value, and it was a great experience. I would definitely go again. And what was your experience off camera? What was your experience? <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Actually, um, I didn't catch that gentleman's name, the one, the, not what? the last before. Tyler? No, 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 no. He was uh, presenting that one app. I think it's Heap. Okay, yeah. yeah. I really liked him. Like, <laughs> just because, um, what he presented was very organized and it like makes it so much easier like on a business side how, uh, business side how to pretty much handle it because right now a lot of things when you're first starting you don't know so it's very manual and then once you kind of get into it you realize like there's so much out there to learn so yeah hopefully you can keep her her audio in there but yeah so that's what the progression conference where i bring in a wealth of different speakers to teach about business growth small business growth and the mindset that you need to really succeed and once you couple up all the systems that I shared at the progression conference you are literally bound to experience new levels of success as soon as you leave but you got to be there you have to show up that's why Absolutely. I share that the opportunity is to show up that you're going to experience these, these wins after the event and you question where it came from like where did that idea come from <laughs> or where did that relationship come from and you start realizing like oh shoot it was because of the progression conference that's amazing awesome. so Andy what advice can and will you leave our audience with? Take action. Take action. And there's, there's probably like a vision that you might have for yourself that is bigger than you can even imagine. Recognizing that that vision is for you. Um, that vision was construed for you. That's you know, At the Progression Conference, someone made a comment on stage, right, who was saying, like, fear is probably a disconnection between you and your source, you and God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm complete disconnection because my belief system is that that big huge vision that I have for myself of the way my mind looks like the way that my body looks like the way that my car is my house my family my future my success looks like that's like God telling me like all right bro I'm gonna let you know what's gonna happen to you okay I'm, I'm gonna let you know what's on the way but in the interim there's, a, there's there's work that needs to be done and recognizing that if you like you could fuck it up 
but I'm just letting you know ahead of time like what's on the way. Like for example, for example, uh, I'll let you know that if you go down Figueroa Street in LA, you go down straight this route. Once you go down this route, if you're ever in downtown LA, once you go down straight this route, down Figueroa Street, there's a spot that says do not enter. On the other side of do not enter is a stable center. So if you want to be go to the stable center, on your way there, there's gonna be a do not enter sign. Once you hit there, you gotta take a right. Once you take a right, you're gonna, to, you're gonna hop on the highway and take exit nine. Exit nine, you're gonna come off Figueroa and you, then you're gonna be able to take a right on back onto Figueroa Street. So you go down Figueroa Street, do not enter, you go around on the highway, then you get off and you take a right. And then you're at the stable center. If I tell you that's the direction, at any moment, you can fuck it up. Mm. You can take a right on the wrong street, you can do something stupid and crash your car. But if you take the right road that I've been telling you to take, then essentially what's going to happen is you will reach the stable center. But on the interim of going to the stable center, here's what happens. You start questioning, am I really supposed to take a right? Mm. <laughs> Was yeah. I really supposed to? Am I? I'm a little nervous right now because the car is, the speed on the highway is much faster than the street. So I'm nervous to go to this level, this, this speed. I'm experiencing what? Fear. But you can handle it. You can handle that 60 miles shift from 25 to 60 miles. And this is a metaphor for life where mm -hmm. essentially if you go down the vision that you have for yourself and you start taking action, things are going to change. That stop sign wasn't supposed to be there. That dead end wasn't supposed to be there. But you're going to have to shift and get on the highway and take a different route. Mm -hmm. But you got to stay focused on the vision. The vision will come true. He's got to take action. Deep. There you guys have it from the man himself, Andy Audet. Take action right now and proximity is power. Speaking of proximity, if you don't have a mentor or you don't have the capital and you have a dream but you don't have the means to get there, Think Big Work Small. He's a great mastermind. His name is David Albanese. Follow him at Think Big Work Small. He's doing monumental things. Thank you again, Andy. We really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for your time, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You.